Welcome back, everyone. So now we continue our workshop, the quantumness of uh, hard cross. Uh, and today, let's welcome our first speaker, Professor Paul Gosu. Uh, so he will tell us about the quantumness of hydronization. Please start. Thank you. Yes. So uh, thanks a lot for inviting me to participate uh, to this Young Star and All Planet uh, workshop. I would like to say this is uh, so schön uh, wieder in Deutschland to, to sein. Uh, of course, uh, even it is uh, vi virtually. So my talk will consist of uh, three parts. Uh, first, I will give you some background and uh, motivation to, to look at the uh, hadronization of uh, C and C bar quarks. Then I will uh, provide some results with the Schrodinger Langevin uh, approach that we derived with uh, Roland Katz. Schrodinger Langevin approach is basically uh, an effective uh, way to deal with open quantum uh, system. And, and then I will go in more conventional and more canonical uh, open quantum schemes that's been uh, established by Jean-Paul and uh, Miguel. And I will uh, provide some uh, results uh, obtained in this scheme, uh, particularly with uh, Stéphane uh, Delorme. Well, okay, so this is typically the, the medium we would like to probe. And of course, what we would like to probe is uh, really the, the QGP that is uh, deep here before freeze-off. And when people start introducing hard probes and, and quarkonia, uh, they explain why it is interested uh, to have hard probes, that produce blah, 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 blah. And then it says that produce only in early PQCD process before the QGP medium. And of course, uh, this is true for jets. This is true for heavy quarks uh, themselves. Uh, but is it true uh, for quarkonia? Uh, after all, uh, quarkonia and especially uh, charmonia are not really produced at initial time. What is produced is a CC bar pair. And then this raises really the question of when are those uh, quarkonia formed? When are they observed? Is it only a result that can be uh, defined? And, and then, of course, a really deeply related question to this is how much quantum mechanics do we need to understand the, the formation? And strictly uh, speaking, uh, suppression was a term that was uh, basically invented in order to denote a reduction with respect to experimental data. But originally, it was not meant to be something that is formed and then later uh, destroyed. And indeed, what is formed at the very early, early stage of the QGP uh, evolution is some coherent quantum state which is then undergo many uh, interaction with the medium around. And, and finally, in the final stage, it is observed as, as a quark point. Then, of course, the evolution operator, even if it is uh, quite complex, uh, is such that the probability to observe uh, any quarkonia in the final stage can be written this way. And, and what uh, is rather questionable is whether or under which circumstances this uh, pro final probability uh, can be written under the differential uh, equation that is some uh, classical uh, master uh, equation. And what is even more questionable is whether we can reduce this uh, master equation to a single uh, diagonal. Um, it, not, however, this is nevertheless what transport uh, models uh, do in some sense, because the most advanced transport models on, on the market uh, they assume two uh, components, uh, one primordial component, which is usually taken to be a singlet is through the full uh, QGP with a given chance to be uh, destroyed. So th there is a kind of a gamma, uh, the gamma uh, rate of destruction per, per unit time. And on, on the top, they introduce a finite uh, coalescence mechanism where C and C bar would find themselves on the late uh, freeze out uh, boundary. And those transport uh, models or transport approach, they've been shown to do uh, on, on the viewpoint of phenology a rather good job as compared uh, to the experimental results. So this is for instance, uh, here comparison of the transport approach by do uh, and, and wrap as a function of the number of particle uh, participant, uh, sorry, and for various uh, PT uh, classes. And obviously uh, there is a good uh, agreement uh, there. Uh, also, we're looking at the elliptical uh, flow that has been already introduced earlier this week, for instance, by Michael. Uh, one can see that the transport approaches are doing a, a quite uh, interesting uh, agreement with, with 
uh, the data, whatever the precise uh, approach uh, here. But for intermediate uh, PT, when uh, the probability uh, for charm quark uh, to recombine uh, statistically become uh, less uh, important, one observes uh, a, a deviation here with respect to the, to the data, which can be uh, understood by, by the fact that the primordial uh, component here is, is a singlet and then does not really uh, interact with the medium and does not uh, benefit from the V2, from the flow uh, of the uh, medium. There are other, uh, so recently, benefiting from uh, the global uh, view uh, on uh, all uh, a set of uh, experimental uh, data, uh, Alice has pro uh, pro proposed uh, an interesting uh, analysis because what they had, they had the V2 and the V3 for both uh, GIPSI, Pion, and, and D uh, Meson. Then they could uh, combine uh, those uh, two uh, flows, both the V2 and the V3, the, the following way. So they did some uh, kind of uh, reverse uh, engineering, assuming that all C uh, quarks here have lost uh, their memory uh, at the late stage of the uh, evolution, which could then uh, lead them to make some uh, kind of reverse uh, engineering and, and then deduce the individual V2 and uh, V3 both of light uh, and uh, C quarks. And then uh, in the second stage, they could uh, recombine the V2 of C uh, quarks and uh, light quarks in order uh, to get uh, some, uh, then reconstruct to the V2 for, for D meson. And then of course we can uh, achieve a different uh, prediction depending on, on the uh, ratio of the transverse momentum that is coming from the light quark with respect to the total uh, D uh, transverse momentum. But uh, in the end, uh, if you believe that this uh, ratio here is uh, reasonable, then you can also uh, achieve a reasonable uh, global agreement with the experimental data as far as the V2 and the V3 are concerned. Uh, of course, they did not attempt uh, to explain the array uh, the same way, at least uh, to my knowledge, but uh, in any case, this would plead uh, towards the disappearance of all CC bar correlations before a freeze out, as it is uh, also uh, postulated in some uh, approach like statistical adronization uh, model. Then this brings me to my uh, motivation. Obviously, there is a need to revisit how robustly we understand the survival of the primordial uh, component. Uh, so we also need to understand the, the coalescence in the late time. Is it something that is really instantaneous? Do we observe uh, this uh, memory uh, disappearance? And of course, all of this should be done uh, taking uh, under account the fact that GIPSI, of course, quantum uh, bound state. So we need a formalism that preserves the quantum uh, properties. And while uh, even the most uh, advanced uh, methods, rigorous methods in open quantum systems, uh, they are probably uh, still at the stage where they cannot deal with uh, all the many uh, CC bar pairs that, that we uh, formed in uh, nucleus, uh, nucleus uh, collisions. So we need to resort at some point to more phenological or effective approaches when we are specifically looking at our CC bar press. And in order to guide those effective approach, it is good uh, to have an understanding of the various uh, time uh, scales that, that are uh, playing in, in, the, in the field, in the medium. And here it's a kind of pretty uh, busy uh, plot. But those two regions here, the yellow rectangle and the blue triangle, uh, are the uh, typical uh, region where it has been shown that a Lindblad equation could be uh, derived, starting from the first uh, microscopic uh, principles, either in uh, here this region of uh, large uh, relaxation uh, time with respect to the system time, or in the region where the environment time would be uh, much uh, smaller than the system time. And this is a quantum uh, Brownian uh, regime uh, where we've seen most of the uh, exact uh, calculation. Some of them have been represented uh, this way. There are uh, really uh, two temperature uh, scales, which are also uh, important to keep in mind. 
So the first one is this uh, temperature from which uh, the noise, the environment noise, starts to be uh, shorter than the system uh, time. And at this uh, temperature, then uh, typically there are no uh, bound state uh, anymore. The things are uh, fully uh, dissolved. Then uh, one can look uh, as a function of the temperature, uh, another uh, property of uh, CC bar bound state that has the spectral densities. Of course, at low uh, temperature, here the peaks can still well be uh, resolved. And, and then there is a re intermediate uh, regime when one uh, observes uh, here the disappearance uh, of the peaks. And for a large uh, temperature, uh, here the peaks have completely uh, disappeared. So uh, it is important to notice that when we are speaking about the quantum uh, Brownian uh, motion and we project on vacuum states, we, we project on states that are here the vacuum states, but does not necessarily uh, correspond to the local uh, eigenstate of any uh, mean field uh, Hamiltonian. Uh, just one projection, quote unquote. Uh, now, another question, of course, is uh, time uh, evolution. So we know the temperature will uh, cool down, but uh, and then we will pass from this regime to the other regime to this last uh, quantum Brownian um, quantum optical uh, regime. And, and to my knowledge, there is no uh, sole uh, formalism that is uh, able to deal with this uh, time uh, evolution, so this one uh, big stake uh, nowadays. And the other question is, uh, of course, uh, the question of decoherence time. So depending whether you are more in this quantum optical or this quantum Brownian regime, after uh, some time, then you either uh, are entitled uh, to, to treat the evolution like uh, a semi-classical uh, Fokker-Planck uh, evolution or, or like uh, a classical uh, master equation as was done first by uh, Nicola Brodin. So here I would, uh, would like to present the first uh, approach that we have uh, tried is a Schrodinger-Langerin uh, equation. It is an effective uh, approach to deal uh, with this. And uh, then uh, basically the equation, Schrodinger-Langerin uh, equation is an equation that you provide here on the top of an evolving uh, QGP uh, scenario. And it typically uh, looks like this. So let me briefly describe the ingredients of the Schrodinger uh, Langevin. So you can uh, recognize here typical uh, mean field that you will get uh, from uh, the lattice. Then uh, there is here this term that is a bit uh, particular, which is in fact a nonlinear uh, term, uh, which depends uh, itself on S which is uh, the phase of the wave function. So it's really essentially a non-linear uh, uh, Schrodinger uh, equation here, depending on uh, the phase. Why the, uh, this uh, basic term, you can uh, look at it, uh, assuming very simple models, and then you can convince yourself that it leads to the relaxation of uh, some uh, motion uh, here. So it's why it's also directly related to the drag uh, coefficient that you can, for instance, uh, extract from the lattice. And the last ingredient here are the uh, fluctuations. Uh, here is also a kind of dipole uh, model, uh, dipole field for the fluctuations, which are uh, these fluctuations here are noise, can be either white noise or color quantum noise, and uh, the uh, fluctuations are related to this uh, dissipation uh, coefficient. So this uh, schrodinger langevin has a couple of nice uh, properties. It is a non-conserving. Uh, it's still nevertheless uh, effective uh, treatment. It cannot be derived from a genuine quantum uh, master equation. But what is uh, nice, it's kind of relatively easy to implement uh, numerically on, on a computer, especially in some kind of Monte Carlo uh, generators. And on the top, uh, you can show, as we have uh, done uh, here in this publication, that uh, after a late time, uh, you, you reach uh, some uh, approximate Boltzmann uh, statistical uh, distribution, which is really uh, important uh, for, for this kind of equation. So here, the, the, the studies that we have made was basically the, the following one, that instead of starting from a state that is uh, closed, so closed CC bar pair, we are starting from a scattering state. 
as was done also by uh, De Boni. Uh, and, and you look at the probability starting from this uh, scattering uh, state to form a, a bound state. So it is really this quote unquote a recombination uh, process. And what you can see is that if you deal with it uh, at a fixed uh, temperature, uh, then looking at uh, both uh, these uh, resonances, is if you just uh, consider uh, stochastic uh, forces, then what you get uh, at the end is typically uh, zero. So the, the, the force, a kind of average to zero genuine transition probability. But if on the top you add the dissipation uh, term, then you, you end uh, at uh, the end of uh, the process uh, with a, a finite uh, probability to produce uh, bo both epsilon uh, or chi. So this is at a constant temperature. But uh, now, if on the top you consider a cooling uh, medium, uh, then what you can see here, and, and this is really the result with all the ingredients, is a cooling uh, potential plus stochastic force plus dissipation, then you see here that the probability to form some epsilon 1s is uh, steadily uh, rising with uh, time. And the same property is observed uh, as well if now you consider the recombination of uh, CC bar. So you see here that the probability to form a, a gypsy is uh, steadily uh, rising, uh, meaning that the main conclusion from uh, this study is that definitively uh, in this uh, quantum uh, approach, the coalescence slash recombination mechanism is definitely something that is not uh, instantaneous. So now let me uh, turn to the second uh, part of, of my talk, which are the quantum master equation established by Miguel and uh, Jean-Paul. And uh, this is uh, a work that we've done with uh, Stéphane. So let me uh, briefly uh, recall what the content of uh, this quantum master equation. So uh, Jean-Paul and, and Miguel uh, start from this uh, here in the working in the Coulomb gauge. They have this charge uh, field uh, interaction and then uh, typically uh, generate the Limblad-like uh, equation uh, following the uh, standard uh, treatment of open quantum system. So basically uh, they make here the bond uh, approximation. So they, they work in the weak uh, coupling uh, limit. Uh, then uh, they uh, assume a large relaxation time with respect to environment. So it's a usual uh, Markov uh, limit, which allows them uh, to establish a local uh, equation here on the density uh, operator that here uh, involves the, the retarded and advanced uh, propagate. So the Next uh, assumption here is precisely uh, to assume one is working at pretty large uh, temperature, and then one makes uh, a gradient uh, expansion uh, at short uh, time, which, which traduces uh, the fact that the medium is evolving much faster than the system, and uh, in in the end you then get uh, these terms, and from those integrals you can perform them resorting to spectral density in the HTL approximation. And, and this is uh, the way that the real screen potential V as well as imagery potential W is uh, introduced uh, into the game. So uh, in the end, uh, the equation they nicely uh, obtain add a, a couple of super uh, operators here. So uh, this was basically those two are together lead to some mean field uh, Hamiltonian. The L2 uh, term contains a fluctuation, while the L3 uh, term here uh, basically contains uh, the friction uh, term. Strictly speaking, uh, the equation is not a uh, Limbian form, so it does not preserve uh, positivity, but they indicate a, a, a way one could deal with uh, this uh, issue in, in, in their paper. Uh, and, and then in order to solve uh, this equation, uh, they uh, suggest to make a semi-classical uh, uh, expansion. Uh, I will not uh, go too much uh, into the, the, the details. Uh, definitively, uh, a project here would be uh, and was to solve those equations exactly without resorting to the semi-classical uh, approximation. And for this, we first needed to introduce some further term L4 
uh, mandatory in order to uh, regain uh, positivity. And, and so the idea here would be to compare the exact solution with the semi-classical uh, ones uh, in, in order to better understand what is the range of validity of those uh, semi-classical uh, uh, approximation. I will now, I think now, directly go to the to the result for this, uh, due to the huge computational cost, we, we needed uh, to resort to 1D uh, simulation uh, only, and then we have uh, introduced a real and imaginary 1D potential that were calibrated on the latest uh, result obtained uh, from uh, lattice QCD in uh, 3D. So if I now uh, go uh, to the results, the first thing that we checked is uh, how uh, the color uh, is equilibrated, starting either from a singlet or an octet uh, state and, and looking at the deviation with respect to the equilibrium value from the color. What one can see a very fast uh, decrease uh, of, of equilibrium uh, behavior. And basically, we converge uh, towards equilibration uh, value in, in typically with some uh, exponential uh, decrease and a faster decrease here when we start from the octet uh, state. If, if I now uh, look at the density matrix uh, itself, so both here as a function of the relative uh, distance and the conjugate relative distance, one can uh, observe from the coherent uh, behavior here uh, a typical uh, convergence uh, towards semi-classical uh, dynamics here, where the density operator is concentrated uh, along uh, the, the diagonal. But uh, yet, there, there is still here a long-lived uh, correlation that, that needs to be better uh, understood. So if we work at slightly higher temperature, then uh, naturally the decoherence de uh, de happens uh, faster. We can also investigate the role of the dissipation term. If we simply set this dissipative term to zero, then what we uh, observe here is uh, really a, a contraction along the main uh, diagonal which can be explained by the fact that you just heat the system with a fluctuation, you never dissipate any energy, then of course you reach here infinite uh, internal temperature. Uh, and here this width, that, that is the De Broglie thermal length, uh, becomes strictly uh, zero. So we, we cover the expected uh, properties. So if we now want to uh, understand better this surviving correlation as well as uh, its nature that happens at small uh, relative distance, then uh, a good idea is to resort to some discrete Wigner uh, transform. So if you are in the realm of uh, semi-classical uh, validity, uh, then the Wigner uh, transform uh, should be purely uh, Gaussian. And at, uh, even at short times, this is typically what we observe for most of, of, of the cases, uh, except here for some distance that somehow corresponds to a tachyonic uh, mode. So one, you can say one is definitely not too far apart from a semi-classical treatment, if one uh, looks here at these uh, observables. But now if we look uh, here at the average uh, p square uh, that uh, we have as a function of the relative distance and for various uh, times, what you can uh, see is that for large distance, one definitely uh, reaches here a constant value, which also corresponds to the thermally uh, expected uh, value. While here at short distance, we have a systematic uh, deviation with respect to the asymptotic uh, value. M meaning that the average uh, p square at short distance is uh, different due to this uh, correlation. We can now uh, project uh, on uh, eigenstates, uh, and this is typically the projection uh, that we, we, we get starting, for instance, from one, uh, one S state. So depending on, on the temperature, what one can see uh, a, a, a pretty uh, simple uh, exponential like uh, decay with a decay uh, rate that increases with a uh, temperature. And on the top uh, here, uh, one uh, see a generation of 1p like or 2s like states uh, along uh, time. 
And a, a nice thing is then to uh, evaluate the quantum uh, entropy. So we, we just here look at the linearized uh, quantum uh, entropy, which uh, typically uh, start from uh, zero in case of we have a fully uh, coherent uh, state. This is what we have at, at the origin while it converges towards, towards some maximal uh, value when the full uh, decurrence uh, has been uh, achieved. And, and here, if you compare between the left uh, and, and, and the right, I'm, I'm sorry, the kind of color do not really uh, co correspond. But if you see, for instance, for 200 uh, MeV, uh, then you see that the typical uh, suppression time here is of the order of uh, five uh, Fermi uh, over C. And at the five Fermi of, over C, then you have just reached half uh, the full uh, decoherence. So this is, for me, a clear sign that suppression and decoherence uh, appear to happen on the same time scale. And, and then uh, this does not go uh, along with what, what we hear from time to time, that after a very fast decoherence time, then we can deal with evolution with uh, classical uh, treatment is apparently not what comes out of our calculation. And then uh, we, we did something that is a bit more uh, realistic. We started from some initial uh, octet uh, state. Uh, definitely, if you start from the octet, the octet is unbound. And then you see that indeed the octet uh, evolution shows that C and, and C bar in the octet uh, channel are definitely uh, going uh, away from each other. But uh, due to the dipole transition operators, there is also uh, some uh, singlet, uh, which is uh, formed uh, along uh, time. And uh, one can look here the same, we can uh, project uh, on uh, the singlet uh, state. And, and one can see that if one starts from one octet here, after a rather a short time, one sees a singlet that is formed. So this is basically, one could view this uh, in, in a way as a gypsy uh, formation. I was questioning uh, initially. So it's a gypsy that is formed due to the transition uh, induced by uh, the QGP. And uh, after this state is uh, kind of decaying uh, to, with, uh, uh, due to the interaction it has with the QGP. So th this is probably the picture which is the best in line with formation at early time and, and then uh, suppression that we find in the transport uh, theory. And uh, still, if I, if I compare the evolution of the quantum entropy and the evolution of the probabilities, we, we, we see by comparing left uh, and, and right that there appear uh, to be on typically uh, the same time scale. So I, I would say we are nevertheless here facing uh, genuine uh, quantum uh, processes. And the, the final uh, result I would like to show today it is uh, the most evolved uh, or, or the closest uh, scenario to phenomenology, where on the top we consider uh, Björken line decreasing uh, temperature. Uh, and then uh, in uh, this case, uh, what uh, you, you, you see is the one S starting from one octet and the one S uh, like kind of uh, saturates uh, at a large time. It even may increase a, a little bit due to the overall uh, cooling and the detail balance that we have uh, between uh, all our states. So that's the Typically, uh, the, the, the picture we have for Charmonia uh, formation from a CC bar pair. And with this, I would like to, to conclude that uh, Parconia uh, and Charmonia uh, for still really a, a challenging and fascinating uh, topic. It is really a fantastic field for the youngest uh, and not so youngest uh, among us. Uh, that it seems that some historical assumption like exponential decay of the state, instantaneous coalescence, adiabaticity, they don't seem to be fully supported by modern uh, ab initio microscopic calculations. Uh, in particular, it is rather clear to me that the so-called recombination process seems to require extended time to bloom uh, fully. And, and uh, the semi-classical approximation, which is for the time being, the only gate that could open uh, the, the treatment of the CC bar uh, in their AA collision 
needs to be better investigated. And for this, we need a more robust benchmark solution. Well, th thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you for your very nice talk. Uh, so now we have uh, time for questions and discussions. Um, if, if any audience have a question, you can uh, speak up or you can raise your hand. Okay. Yeah, I have some questions. So in the in the slides, in which you show how the the color evolves, I think it was uh, forty five. Yes. I I didn't understood what is the the dashed line. So we just, um, yeah, yeah, I'm 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 sorry. I went I went too fast uh, on on this, Miguel. So th this uh, are both so those are the deviation with respect to equilibrated uh, value okay it is basically one and, and eight uh, typically so the plane line are the things that if you start from a singlet uh, initial uh, state while the dash ones are, are uh, the lines if you start from some okay. octet initial uh, state so, so you, you see it, it evolves uh, fast uh, if you start from octet. Oh. Ah, okay, so what I should see in this plot is that they go to zero very fast. That's the yeah, that's yeah, and, and yeah, and, and after here, th th there is some kind of uh, saturation here, and and, and this uh, is probably due to the fact that we have a finite uh, grid, uh, and, and then we okay, yeah. there's also kind of discretization uh, errors, and we should not re really basically rely too much on 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 these low values. Yes. Okay, okay, thanks. Uh, okay, uh, then I have a question related to this one. So that's the octet state uh, correspond to a PQ bar singlet state with a gluon. So could I understand it as like a bond state, like a J psi with a gluon? Is that what it corresponds to? No, no, he, 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 we are solely, we, we, we are just looking at the CC bar, so we, we have no uh, gluons uh, in, the, in, in the model, so it's just a CC bar that is starting in the octet uh, re re representation. But, but so, of course, tra transition between octet and singlet are, are induced by the imaginary uh, potential, which contains uh, this gluon emission and absorption by interaction with, with the medium. So if in the end, if you look at the GSI production rate, then you only take the singlet component and ignore the octet part, is that correct? This is a, a, a very good question that one should discuss. Within in, in this is this long distance matrix element that, that we are using in NRQCD for, for in, in, in proton proton, they would also apply in, in this situation or, 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 or whether they, they should not be applied and on, on, only consider the singlet uh, component. I, I don't know if uh, people who are much more knowledgeable in an RQCD than I could, could take on this uh, question. So I don't know whether Nora is a, a, around or not. No, she's not there. Uh, so M M M Miguel, you, you, you have an idea about this. What is your personal opinion about her uh, octet contribution at the end of the Q QGP, whether one should take it or not? Ah, in the projection, that's, yeah. uh, that's a good question. What, what, what I understand is anyhow, this octet contribution that you use in, in, in the long distance matrix element, that coming from this very soft gluon uh, em, em, emission in, in, in PP. And then when you do something that is so dense as a QGP, that probably not the same, cannot be universal from PP to, to AA. So that's. Um, yeah. So 
I think, well, I'm not sure now, but I think the contribution from the, uh, from the octet states, mm -hmm. at, like a low energy, if you consider only interaction from soft gluons, I think it's suppressed by a power of R because like the, the wave function of full quarkonion will project to the singlet and then a contribution of the, to the octet that is suppressed by R. R is the q bar separation? Yes, but that's in, in the dipole limit. Mm -hmm. However, if something outside of these limits, I I wouldn't know. In principle, in non-relativistic QCD, so if you are not using the dipole limit, this is not the case. And, and probably there are temperature corrections there. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, actually I have some, some questions about this slide. So this is like the, the beginner distribution for fixed separation between the the heavy quarks. Yes. Right. Yeah, yes. 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 Miguel. So th th this is exactly this. So we we transform with respect to uh, to y basically. So this is a discrete Wigner uh, transform. Yes. Okay. So do you understand why it looks like? If I understood it correctly, it. It is less classical the more you separate the heavy quarks. So, right? yeah, here it's, it's probably not the, the best uh, illustration, oh. but of course, here you are just at, at, at one Fermi over C, why you started from a pair that is very, very close. So, so, here, what you have for I equal two and I equal three, I, I think those are kind of. Uh, bias coming from the ultra relativistic uh, e e evolution okay because you have non relativistic uh, hamiltonian that basically have, but okay th this should not be taken too much uh, in, into account and, and here the absolute probability here is, is quite small so so, so here I, I would say that overall if you start from a singlet after one one fermi you have something that is nearly a gaussian if, if you start, I don't have the illustration here, but if you start from some uh, octet, uh, then the Gaussian shape uh, are only achieved after something like two from me overseas. So, so there are some transient time uh, du during which uh, classical uh, Wigner Gaussian shape uh, are, are not achieved from, from the simulation. Okay. Okay, very good. <laughs> Okay. I have a question from the audience. Okay. Okay. So, thank you very thank much. You very much. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Uh, okay. Bye. So, so we will take um a uh, thirty five minutes break. So according to our schedule, we will start our second talk and 16.30, so that's 